All right, so we're picking up in Matthew chapter 8, verse 11. Matthew 8, 11. We're speaking about last week about that centurion who had the servant that Jesus healed. <clears throat> and of course, I'll just read verse 10 and 11. It says, When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And I say unto you, that many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. So I see three truths in verse 11. First of all, you and I are in the Bible. Uh, if you believe in Jesus Christ and you're sitting from this part of the world, that's you right there. It says, many shall come from the east and the west. This is the west. <clears throat> and how do I know that? Well, according to Ezekiel chapter 5, verse 5, Jerusalem is the center of God's map. It says in Ezekiel 5, 5, Thus saith the Lord God, this is Jerusalem. I have set it in the midst of the nations and countries that are round about her. So the center of God's map is Jerusalem. So whenever you're reading and studying through the Bible and you come to north, south, east, west, it means north, south, east, west of Jerusalem. So that's you and me. You're in the Bible. You're, you, you believe in Christ. And what more, even better, you're going to sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that's the second truth in the verse that's incredible, is that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob lived about 4,000 years ago. And you're going to sit down with them. That's incredible in itself. Uh, they will be resurrected <clears throat> at the second coming of Jesus Christ. I believe that all, all Christians in the church will be resurrected at the pre-tribulation rapture. And that all the Old Testament saints will be resurrected at the second coming of Jesus Christ, the end of the tribulation. And you can find that in Daniel chapter 12. <clears throat> the third thing I see... Uh, in this verse that's very important is that there's going to be a literal physical kingdom of God on this earth headquartered in Jerusalem Israel uh, he says the kingdom Abraham and Isaac are going to sit down in the kingdom and the reason why that's so important is because many people have spiritualized the Bible they teach replacement theology that God's done with the nation of Israel and the Jewish people and so all those promises are for the church and not for them. And it's wrong. It's evil, actually. Uh, that actually enabled uh, Hitler to do a lot of what he did to the Jewish people in, in the Nazi days. Because you had a thousand years of Catholicism, which teaches replacement theology, that the church has replaced Israel as the new people of God. And so you, you really, you had this kind of simmering anti-Semitism based on their religious beliefs that the church has replaced Israel, replaced Israel. After all, they murder Jesus, they're bad, and the church has replaced them. So why not just kill them all? And that's actually, Hitler said that too. He said, I'm just doing what the church has been doing. Because actually the popes, this is not in my notes, but the popes were actually the first ones to put Jews in ghettos and give them armbands. Uh, you'll learn that if you read some history. So Hitler said, listen, I'm just doing what the church has been doing, except I'm going to finish the job. Uh, so <clears throat> it's very important what we believe in rightly dividing the word of truth, because that's going to happen again, in case you're not aware of that. According to the Bible, during the seven-year tribulation, also called the time of Jacob's trouble, the time of Israel's trouble, uh, the Antichrist is going to wipe out two-thirds uh, two-thirds of the Jewish people on planet Earth are going to be wiped out during the tribulation, a worse holocaust than under Hitler. And uh, the nations, <clears throat> according to the Bible, the nations will actually be judged in a great part on how they treat the Jewish people during the tribulation. You find that in Matthew chapter 25. When Jesus says, I was poor and you fed me. I'm butchering the quote, but he talks about I was in jail and you visited me. And they said, when do you do it? When you did it to one of my brethren. He's talking about the Jews during the tribulation. 
they're going to be persecuted like never before. And it says in Joel chapter 3 that one of the main reasons that Jesus Christ is going to judge the nations is because they have scattered, it, scattered my heritage Israel and parted my land. So those are one, two of the main reasons God is going to pour out his judgment on this world. Uh, so another thing back to Matthew chapter 8. You and I are going to sit down in the kingdom of heaven. Uh, we should think about that often. It'll help you, especially in these days that we're living in. Not a lot in the news good to think about right now. Uh, but this is not our this is not our home. This is not it. This is temporary. Our life is a vapor. But we're going to be with God forever in his eternal glory. And so my point is, when you read a verse like this, uh, it says, we're going to sit down in the kingdom of heaven. We should take some time and think about that and what that's going to be like and how wonderful that's going to be. That's called meditation, meditating on the word of God. It's critical because uh, this life can be depressing and sad and hard. That's one of the reasons we should meditate on God's promises. <clears throat> uh, one last note, that kingdom period of Jesus' 1,000 year kingdom on earth, that's written about more than any other prophecy topic in the Bible that I'm aware of. That's the biggest topic of all Bible prophecy. Um, well, not the biggest topic, excuse me. Jesus Christ is the biggest topic, but there's more written about that time period of the millennium than any other time period is what I meant to say. So, praise the Lord. We're going into the kingdom soon. Thy kingdom come. Look at verse 12, Matthew 8, 12. <clears throat> now, this is not such a, night, a pleasant truth. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Uh, the children of the kingdom here is speaking about the Jewish people. And the terrible truth is, is that many of God's earthly national people, the Jewish people, are going to be cast out of his kingdom forever. It's a very solemn truth that teaches us that you must be more than a believer in name to avoid ending up in hell. Okay, that's one truth from that verse. You have to be more than a believer in name to avoid ending up in hell. You can be circumcised, you can be baptized, you can be canonized, you can go to synagogue, you can go to church, you can go to mass. You can do whatever you want to do, but unless you're born again, you will perish. You need more than a religious heritage or upbringing. You need a living relationship with God through the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what you need. To avoid hell. It says. <clears throat> outer darkness. Now. I don't know exactly what that means. Except that it's horrible. I can tell you that much. I assume. As I, as I so thought about this. As a, uh, outer darkness. I assume that it means. As far away from light. As you could possibly be. As far away from light as you could possibly be. People that are going to end up in the lake of fire, also known as hell, the final destination of the wicked, those people will be in darkness forever. They will be in darkness in every sense of the word. Maybe we can get a small hint of what that means. You don't have to turn there, but I'm going to read it to you. It's Exodus chapter 10, verse 21 through 23. Uh, it's the plague of darkness that God brought upon the Egyptians when, uh, when he brought the children of Israel out. Here's what it says about that darkness in Egypt. <clears throat> the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand toward heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even darkness which may be felt. And Moses stretched forth his hand toward heaven, 
and there was a thick darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. So it says darkness could be felt. As I said, maybe this is a small idea of what outer darkness is. Darkness that can be felt. Uh, it was a thick darkness, it says. And it says in verse 23, They saw not one another, neither rose any from his place for three days. So the Egyptians didn't move for three days because it was so dark they could see nothing they couldn't even see their hand right in front of their face it was so dark they could feel the darkness I don't know what that means but it's not good but here is the good part here's the ray of light the children of Israel had light in their dwellings the children of Israel had light in their dwellings and so while the wicked shall forever be in outer darkness, God's people shall forever enjoy his light. Let me read a few verses. You can write them down and just listen along if you want, whatever you want to do. 1 John 1 9, you know this one. <clears throat> Sorry about that. 1 John 1 5 says this this then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that god is light and in him is no darkness at all if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness we lie and do not the truth here's the verse i was looking for first john 1 7 but if we walk in the light as he is in the light we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Okay, so God is light. And so as God's people, we're going to enjoy that light forever. It also says in Colossians 1, Colossians 1, 12 through 14. In whom we have redemption, that is in Christ. God's dear Son, in whom we have redemption. Sorry about that. Colossians 1, 12 through 14. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet, that is fitting, fit. God has made us fit to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. In light. Who has delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Okay, so God is light. We're going to walk in the light. He's delivered us from the power of darkness, translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, and made us partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. <clears throat> How about Revelation 21, verses 10 and 11? Just listen. Revelation 21, 10 and 11. Now this is in contrast to the outer darkness. This is where you and I will be. Revelation 21, 10 and 11. He carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And then in 23 and 24 of Revelation chapter 21, verses 23 and 24, says this of the eternal glory that you and I are going to enjoy. It says this, And the city, the new Jerusalem, the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it for the glory of God did lighten it and the lamb is the light thereof and the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it and the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day for there shall be no night there okay one more verse, and that's Revelation 22, verse 5. It says, There shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, 
and they shall reign forever and ever. And so uh, we have a glorious eternal future of light, God's light. You can't imagine there won't be a need of the sun or the moon or the stars, none of that. God's glory is going to light up the whole place. Uh, so as Paul said, I encourage you, brethren, think on these things. Think on these things. We should be meditating constantly about the eternal glory that awaits us. It'll change our lives. But back to Matthew chapter 8, we should, often, we should also meditate about hell. We should meditate on hell as well. And there's reasons for that we're going to get to. <clears throat> back to Matthew 8.10. <clears throat> it says, The children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So we covered outer darkness. Now it says weeping and gnashing of teeth. So the weeping speaks of the terrible suffering and pain of hell. I know this is not a fun conversation and it's not a fun topic, but it's the word of God. And so we need to deal with it. We need to hear it and we need to believe it. And so Jesus says, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And the weeping speaks of the terrible suffering and pain that people will experience in hell. The gnashing of teeth speaks of intense hatred toward God. So contrary to the false doctrine of purgatory, suffering and fire doesn't make you better so you can go to heaven. People in hell hate God. They hate him. And they will forever hate him. And it says in Job 16.9, and the reason why I'm going to read that to you is because I want you to know what it means, gnashing of teeth. Now, I already knew that it meant hatred, the gnashing of teeth. But I never, for some reason, I don't remember ever looking up this verse in Job, which is chapter 16, verse 9. Chapter 16, verse 9, which, by the way, if you remember, we've spoken about something called the principle of first mention. In the Bible, you have something called the principle of first mention. And it's, that's if you want to know what a word means in the Bible, the best thing to do, nine times out of ten, not in every single case, but nine times out of ten, if you go to the first time that word is mentioned in the Bible, you will find the best definition, biblically, what that word means. So it's called the principle of first mention. And so the first time that phrase, gnashing of teeth, is mentioned in the Bible is Job 16.9. Here's what it says. He teareth me in his wrath, who hateth me. He gnasheth upon me with his teeth. Mine enemy sharpeneth his eyes upon me. So you see, not only is this the first mention of gnashing of teeth, but the word hated is in there. So it's a connection, clearly, obviously. So it says that in Job 16, 9. So that's where I get that, in case you wanted to know. Gnashing of teeth means hatred. And of course... It's pretty clear if you look at Acts chapter 7, verse 54, you remember that, I'm sure, where Stephen, uh, that deacon in the early church, the first martyr of the Christian church, Stephen gives that long sermon to the Israelites, and they were mad. And here's how it ends. I'll just, the, the verse is Acts 7, 54, but I'm just going to read a couple of highlights right before that. He, of what he said to these people. He says in verse 51, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? They end, they have slain them, which showed them before the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers. You've received the law by disposition of angels and have not kept it. And it says... In verse 54, and when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. They were mad. And of course, they stoned him to death. So the point is, it's pretty clear that gnashing of teeth speaks of hatred. And that's something. These people in hell forever are going to hate God intensely. Uh, and unfortunately, they're going to be trapped that way forever. So, as we talked about before that I said we should believe on the eternal glory that awaits us as believers, I think that we should also meditate on hell sometimes. 
certainly more often than we do, I'm sure, uh, because it'll have a huge impact on our lives. First of all, meditation on hell will cause us to treat people better, specifically lost people. It'll help us to have more mercy and grace toward them, more love and compassion towards them, and more boldness towards them to preach the gospel. Uh, so meditation on hell will give us that those traits that we need. Meditation on hell will cause us to love God more. Meditation on hell will cause us to love God more for saving us from it. That because of his grace, because of his amazing grace and his precious gospel and the precious blood of Jesus Christ shed on the cross for your sins, for our sins, we're not going to hell. And so not only will it cause us to love God more as we meditate on the fact that we're not going to hell, but it'll also cause us to be very thankful. Gratitude. So it's, it's a problem. Even sometimes we as Christians forget that we should be the most thankful people on the planet. And so meditation on hell will help us to be thankful to God. Also, another good effect, and I'm sure there's more of them, Another good effect of meditating on hell would be that we will pray more fervently for the lost. The Bible says that the fervent and effectual prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Well, if we think about the fact that these lost friends and neighbors and relatives and co-workers are going to go to this place forever, maybe it will cause us to pray more fervently for them. Well, no, no maybe about it. It will. Uh, and so... I think that maybe these are some of the reasons that I just shared with you, not only of why we should meditate on hell, but maybe these, some of these reasons are why Jesus spoke more about hell than anyone else in the whole Bible for some of these reasons, possibly. And I also think, of course, it's because Jesus Christ is the creator. He created hell for the devil and his angels. And unfortunately, we rebelled against him. And so there's nowhere else to go. Uh, we are, God is eternal. Sin is an eternal crime. And we are eternal beings. So that's, that's just the way it is. If we reject the fountain of eternal living water, there is nowhere else to go except to the fire of hell. There is nowhere else. Uh, and so I believe this is one of the some of the many reasons why Jesus warned about hell more than anyone else in the Bible. Oh, how the mockers and the scoffers and the religious hypocrites will weep and wail in hell forever. And it's going to be too late. It's going to be too late. They will be left to do so forever without hope and without comfort and without relief and without salvation. There's no repentance now. Today is the day of salvation. It is appointed unto men once to die, and after that, the judgment. You have to come to know Jesus Christ now. So come to him right now before it's too late, because you're not going to get a second chance. So back to Matthew 8, verse 13. Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way, and as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And his servant was healed in the selfsame hour. So <clears throat> this man exercises this great faith that made Jesus marvel. And we talked about last week how there's only two times it says Jesus marveled in the Gospels. The first time, the other time was at the, the faith of the Canaanite woman, the Syrophoenician woman. Uh, when she made the comment about the breadcrumbs falling from the table, Jesus says Jesus marveled at her faith. And then here it says he mar. Uh, excuse me. Boy, I'm just out of control today, uh, getting things wrong. It was the unbelief of the Jews that made him marvel the one time, and the other time is marveling at this man's faith. <clears throat> Sorry about that. I don't know what happened to me. Anyway, uh, so as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. Maybe I should stick with the notes that I wrote. All right, as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. Here's an important lesson we learned from Matthew 8, 13. Lack of faith can either prevent or limit God from working miraculously in our lives. Okay, let me say that again. Lack of faith can either prevent or limit 
God from working miraculously in our lives. Not because he lacks the power, but because in his sovereignty, he's chosen to operate through faith. Okay? It tells us in Psalm 78, verse 40. Psalm 78, verse 40. Hopefully I got this one right this time. Psalm 78, verse 40. Okay. Verse 41 and 40. Okay. Psalm 78, 40 and 41. I scared myself there for a minute. Listen to what it says. It's speaking about how when after God brought the children of Israel out of Egypt and they were in the wilderness. It says, how often did they provoke him in the wilderness and grieve him in the desert? Yea, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. They limited him. At that was at their unbelief, right? And this is the people that saw more miracles than any generation in history. And then they get out and they say, oh, we're going to die. We can't, there's no water. There's no food. Uh, after God just did all these miracles right in front of them. Uh, but don't miss the point. It says they limited the Holy One of Israel. You mean the all-powerful, almighty God can be limited? Yes. Yes, Calvinists. Yes, he can. It's right there. They limited the Holy One of Israel. And they did that by their lack of faith. That's what limits. Lack of faith. Uh, if you're writing verses down, I'm just going to read quickly Hebrews 11.6. Hebrews 11.6 says, Without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So without faith it's impossible to please him. That's because this is how God has chosen to operate. And uh, if you'd like a lesson on the importance of faith, you can just read the whole chapter, Hebrews 11. That's what it's all about, faith. <clears throat> okay, now, so we see uh, this centurion servant was healed because this man exercised faith. Now, with all everything I just said, I want to remind you that it is not always God's will to heal us. A lot of confusion about this among people today. So, Lord willing, I'm going to clear up some confusion from the Bible. Uh, it's not always God's will to heal us. I'm going to start with 1 Timothy 5.23. 1 Timothy 5.23. So, uh, Paul's writing to Timothy, and he tells him, Drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. So apparently Timothy had some kind of stomach issues. This was 2,000 years ago. They didn't have Pepto-Bismol. You know, you couldn't go uh, take some Tums. All right. So he says, use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. Now, wait a minute. Where's Paul's faith? Why didn't he just name it and claim it and say, listen, Timothy, you don't have enough faith. Okay. Just pray to the Lord and he'll heal you. Right? No. He told him, use some wine. Paul, by the way, rose someone from the dead. So he was able to do miracles. But it's not always God's will to heal. Uh, 2 Timothy 4.20. 2 Timothy 4.20. Uh, Paul is writing again to Timothy. And at the end of his letter, he says... Erastus abode at Corinth, but Trophimius, excuse me if that's wrong, have I left at Miletum sick. So Paul had to leave one of his companions at a place called Miletum because he was sick. He left them there. Well, why didn't Paul heal him? Why didn't he tell him to pray? The Lord will heal you. Where's your faith, brother? No, he didn't say any of that. He said, I left them there sick. So my point is, in these verses, is that it's not always God's will to heal. Uh, and as a reminder, God didn't create disease and sickness and death. God created a perfect paradise, and none of that stuff existed. And then we decided we're going to be our own, we're going to run our own lives, and we're going to be our own gods, and we're going to do what we want. And so we rebelled against God, and that brought the curse of sin and death and sickness and all that stuff into the world. 
Uh, so thank God that one day when we get our glorified bodies, there's going to be no more of that, right? So let me give you a quote now from a book it was recommended by a Christian friend of mine. Uh, it's called the David Cloud Way of Life Encyclopedia of the Bible and Christianity, sixth edition. And uh, it's an excellent book. I highly recommend it for everyone's library. But I want you to hear what David Cloud, Pastor David Cloud, says about uh, not always being God's will to heal. <clears throat> uh, he says this, Paul was not healed. And you can read about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He says, Paul was not re uh, healed. He says, we read that the Apostle Paul was afflicted with some sort of infirmity. We are not told the exact nature of Paul's problem, but the word translated infirmities is also translated weakness in the same chapter, verse 9. It's also translated sickness in Matthew 8, 17. And it's translated disease in John eleven four. So that same word for infirmities. So three times the faithful apostle asked God to take away this problem. But the Bible says God refused to do so. He says, my grace is sufficient for thee. He was told that his infirmity was something that God wanted him to have for his spiritual well-being. See, now God is not just more, uh, concerned about our physical well-being because that's temporary. But, uh, and these are my words, not David Cloud's, but I'm just throwing that out there. This life is a preparation for eternity. And the Lord Jesus Christ, who is perfect and always has been, yet the Bible says through sufferings, he was made perfect. He was made perfect through sufferings. How about that? The perfect one was made perfect through sufferings. So how much more you and me? He's sinless. And it says he was made perfect through sufferings. Well, I'm convinced at this point, after being a Christian for 15 years, that suffering is an essential and important part of Christianity. Not something you'll hear from the TV preachers or too many preachers too often, but it's important. Uh, it's not fun. It doesn't feel good. But if our Lord Jesus Christ suffered, hello. Okay, we need, we need it. So, but back to David Cloud's comment. Paul asked God to take away this problem three times, and he was, and God said no. And, and, God, and, and the point is that Paul bowed to God's will. As David Cloud says, this is a perfect example for Christians today. We should pray for healing and release from trials. But when God does not heal, we must bow to his will and accept that sickness or trial as something from the hand of God. This is not lack of faith. It is obedience to the sovereignty of God. And that's what David Cloud says about that. And so back to Matthew 8, 13. We're going to wrap up shortly. Uh, back to Matthew 8, 13. It said, Jesus said to the centurion, Go thy way, and as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And his servant was healed in the selfsame hour. Uh, and in that phrase there, it says his servant was healed. We learn an important truth from that phrase, and it's comforting. And it's this, our faith will be rewarded. Our faith will be rewarded. That man had faith, and Jesus healed him. So even though God doesn't have to, even though God ought just to be trusted because of who he is, he still rewards us anyway because he's so gracious and he's so good. We're going to look at a handful of scriptures and I'm going to close. Matthew 16, 27. Matthew 16, 27. Speaking of, Jesus is going to reward our faith when he comes. It says, For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels. Then shall he reward every man according to his works. <clears throat> okay, the next verse I want to read concerning Jesus rewarding us for our faith when he comes. Luke 6.35 Love ye your enemies, and do good, and lend, hoping for nothing again. 
and your reward shall be great. And ye shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Uh, two more verses. Hebrews chapter 10. Technically three verses. Hebrews 10, 35 through 37. I guess that's a little more. Hebrews 10, 35 through 37. It's not my day today, I guess. Hebrews 10. Don't worry, next time I'm gonna we're gonna take turns starting next Sunday. You guys are all gonna preach a message each week just to so you can sweat a little bit. Alright. Hebrews 10. <laughs> Hebrews 10, 35 through 37. The word of God says, Cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, and will not tarry. And the last verse is Revelation 22, verse 12. Jesus said, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. <laughs>